여러분 안녕하세요. 제가 한국말로 오늘 하려 그랬는데 시간이 많이 없어가지고 영어로 하겠습니다. 20분 안에 끝내야 되니까 오늘 토픽이 좀 브라드해서 처음서부터는 어 와인이 지금 오늘 패널 디스커션이 와인 에볼루션이라 그러는데 사실은 제가 보기에는 it's a wine and food revolution. The first revolution. I'm going to first take a kind of macro view. But first, we had in our culture, if we could identify one commonality in Far East Asia, is that we were using chopsticks, and that limited us to the kind of food that we can eat. So, if you look at the introduction of when in each culture and each country in Asia started to use the fork and knife. You realize that actually the way of eating and the kind of food starts to change. The other thing that has really made a huge, I think, impact from a macro and as well as an industry point of view is really looking at, um, especially Johnny and Teresa's restaurant, and see that there is actually a lot of science and understanding of food chemistry, of food. Um, Uh, techniques that have been refined to be able to give you uh, flavors and, and tastes and combinations that were unthought of before. The other wine revolution that I would like to touch upon is really that you've got wine everywhere, not just in wine shops or in supermarkets, but in convenience stores. And every corner shop now sells wine. And the other big factor in the wine revolution in the last 20 years is what I call the China factor. And with the Chinese introduction into the market, you have completely transformed. In about 25 years, Asia has become a serious wine-consuming country. And if you look at China and how they've been producing wine. They're already the number five wine-producing region in the world. They're also the number one consumer of all red wine, and the number one consumer of all red Bordeaux wines. Why has wine become so popular? Well, the image of wine in Asia first was, I would say, a wealthy person's an affluent beverage. That a lot of middle class could not afford, if we're looking 30, 40 years ago. But it's seen as healthy. The, the first interest in wine came in the mid 1990s, when there was the 60-minute documentary on the French paradox about how drinking red wine was actually, uh, despite having high fat content in the diet, contributing to a healthy. Lifestyle or, or a healthy uh, way of um, dining, and so our traditional drinks here in Korea, soju in China, baijiu. These are high alcohol drinks that didn't really have a positive health value. Wine was seen as sophisticated, cool, and for those who are collecting wine and buying wine on a major level. It An alternative investment, like art, where you know that if you bought the wine cheap, it would it would grow in price and and value in 10, 20 years time. Here's the image of soju and some local spirits. It's a ganbe style of drinking, one shot. You know, ganbe means dry glass. It means the same in Ch uh, Chinese as well as in uh, Japanese. So our way of drinking alcohol was really for the alcoholic effect and not for their flavor. It has high alcohol. Of course, it's uniquely Korean. And the image of soju, even when you have very high quality soju, uh, with made out of rice and not just any starch, it still has a, has, a, has a negative image as a cheap drink that's really for older generation who embrace this. And now the younger generation is drinking it mainly because it's cheap. So to understand how wine plays a role in different markets, I thought this chart would be very useful to, to compare Asia and North America. 
America and Western Europe. And this is a recent study done by um, Bank of America Merrill Lynch when they looked at all the alcoholic beverages and the consumption, and beer, of course, is number one everywhere. But if look closely at the spirit and wine consumption, and you can see that in, in more developed cities where fine dining culture and, and a culture of spending more time when you're during the meals has translated into a, a real growth in wine, whereas spirits constitutes a very small, single-digit percentage. But in Asia-Pacific, including Korea, uh, you are talking over 10% in spirits and less than 10% in the single digits for wine. But I believe, and we can see the trend in terms of growth, that wine is moving toward the direction uh, of being in the double digits. So this is definitely bound to grow. So, the first question you're probably asking is, why bother to have a wine list? I'm doing well in my restaurant. Um, you know, what is wine going to add to, to the value of my restaurant? Well, if you're thinking of doing more premium food, more, more um, fine dining, but everyone is moving away from fine dining and more into um, smart but casual, relaxed atmospheres, you're still going to want to charge a little bit more for the dishes that you're creating. Well, in this kind of setting, wine works very well. And there's also even a demand, and a popularity, and among the younger generation, a real curiosity about what wine is. Another reason, of course, is to complement the food. And the main reason, I think, in Korea, you should have a solid wine list is because we don't really understand how much a good wine list with a good structure and system can really add to the value of your final bottom line. So, as a, as a, as a kind of casual survey, I asked a lot of three Michelin star chefs and restaurants what percentage of their sales of an average table comes from wine. And maybe I'll ask you, Johnny, what's, what's an average percentage of your sales total bill comes from wine? 50% or 40? <laughs> Therese? Would it be half or less or more? No. Yeah, half. half, half. I, think, I think half. I half. think yeah, half, half. Half, half? Yeah. Emmanuel? Yes, half, half. Half, half. But it's more, it's more easy to, to sell a bottle of wine than to do the, the yeah. dish. It's different. But it's, yeah, and I think it's different. In, in Holland, people drink a lot of wine, eh? So, yes, it's a higher consumption country, so of course the odds are different. But if I asked, let's say, the two Korean chef owners here, what is the percentage, approximately, you don't have to be accurate, but of wine sales, of the total bill do you have on average, what would your answer be? Hi, Young. Oh, five to ten percent, he says. Oh, nine to ten percent. So, 25 to 30 percent at Mingles. So, actually, 25 to 30 percent is considered hugely successful in Asia. Because I've done the exact same survey in Hong Kong, where we have both a lot of uh, fine dining Western restaurants as well as Chinese and Asian restaurants. And the number for Asian restaurants is almost always below 30 percent. And the number for Western restaurants is 50% or more. So this um, is actually something that's pervasive in Asia, that we don't really know how the wine can really contribute, not just to the experience of your, your customers and guests, but also to your bottom line. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but when does having a wine list in Asia really make sense? when you have what I call seats that linger, where people stay and lounge 
and talk and, and interact, whether it's because you have a lounge area or you have a, a very good bar set up. These are perfect places where you can actually add wine and, and have it translate into a concrete bottom line uh, benefit for your restaurant. And as more Korean and Asian restaurants are using Western ingredients or Western techniques, or as um, many uh, of the top Michelin star Korean restaurants received, you can see that they have a modern approach to Korean food. And when you do, then wine can and should play a very important role. You also need to make sure that you have the right storage capacity and a staff that's fairly wine savvy, or at least a sommelier who can actually train other people on the ground. Now, this is something we can go into a little bit later. But before I do, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how the Korean palate and wine at the Korean table can be very, very challenging. When I was writing my first book um, from 2007 and to 2009, one of the things I did was spend a lot of time in the kitchens of these top local Korean restaurants, Chinese restaurants, Thai restaurants, Japanese restaurants. And what I looked at was, what are the condiments that the chefs are using? What's in the kitchen? What's your most common ingredient? How do you salt your food? How do you add sugar? How do you add sour? flavors. And when, when I looked, being Korean, when I looked at our definition of what is delicious, not many people outside of Korea might think that different kinds of kimchi is delicious. The other challenge we have as a country that was so poor for so long is that the, one of the biggest items on our menu is tang, which is soup. And actually, the soup is the main dish. You have rice on the side and other uh, banchan on the side, but our soup comes in a bowl where you could almost wash your face. That's how big the bin is, the, the bowl is. And here, you have challenges of liquid pairing with liquid. So in Korean cuisine, there are many different challenges, including what we define as really delicious. And I want to touch upon umami as a concept and as a, as a taste that I'm sure anyone who follows uh, you know, food uh, knows fairly well and you're all familiar with it. But in Korea, we chase umami like uh, other people chase um, subtlety and, and, and um, uh, you know, flavored texture. We in Korea love umami. What is it exactly? It's, it's a glutamic acid that was identified more than 100 years ago in Japan uh, by a Japanese professor, and maybe we know it as um, miwan, or ajinomoto in Japanese, which is a manufactured version of monosodium glutamate. But glutamic acid is a naturally <coughs> occurring amino acid, and it plays off of organic and nucleic acids to produce a, a taste that we find in, in, in Korea and throughout Asia as delicious. All the soups that we enjoy have very high umami content. All of the seasonings we use, from tenjang to ganjang to you know, matjang, all of these tangs are fermented. These are flavors that are so high in umami that we know, we grew up with them, we don't even think about it. And that's why all of our fast foods have umami in, from, uh, from your uh, snack foods to uh, instant noodles to just about everything. So the way that I broke down how wine and Korean flavors should be paired was really more in a structured way. So I looked at the structure of the basic taste, you know, salty, sweet, bitter, sour, umami. I looked at palate, texture, and sensation. And I looked at the structure of wine, not just the flavors, but really the level of acidity, tannins, the body, the alcohol. These are things that you can actually measure. 
So the structure is the unchanging character and quality of the wine. So what's important to note in the flavors that we're using in Asia, one of them I mentioned as salty, we use soy sauce. In China, they use oyster sauce. They use in shrimp paste quite a bit in, in the southern part, and fish sauce in the southern part of Asia. We also use a lot of fermented bean paste, all different kinds of tenjang. And this is something that we use as a base, just like the Japanese use uh, dashi as the base of all of their soups. The kind of sour taste that we use, uh, the acidity component. If you look at the typical vinegar that's used in France or Italy, and you compare it to the rice vinegar that we use most commonly, it has a very different taste, and it's a lot more mellow with a higher umami content with rice vinegar. Sweetness is also very different. It's used differently in every culture. And in Korea, we don't use that much sweetness. Bitterness, again, every, every Asian uh, culture and also kitchen has a different emphasis on whether they want to de-emphasize or emphasize bitterness. Um, and umami, as I mentioned, is a very important component for Korean food. So if we look at this chart, it gives you a sense of how I measured Korean food in terms of its basic flavor elements and how I considered wine, what really pairs in a structural way. Um, and, and this was something that really um, helped me break down each Asian cuisine's components. So for example, in Korea, we have a lot of fermented strong flavors. We have a lot of salt. We don't emphasize sweetness we have a propensity to really enjoy bitter tastes more than other Asian cuisines. We're very high on umami, and the intensity of all of those flavors for us has to be strong. That's how we like it. So all of these gives way to a set of wine considerations that are really appropriate for this type of cuisine. So we have to remember that for Korean cuisine, it's family style, everything comes out all at once, but as uh, restaurants like uh, Kaon that re received three Michelin stars, or many that received two and one, you realize that this family style is evolving a little bit. It doesn't mean that we are moving toward just course by course kind of eating, but you can start grouping flavors together. All the pan fried chons coming out three or four small dishes at a time, or flavors that are more earthy and savory coming out at one time, or the very spicy dishes coming out as a group, perhaps toward the end. So this is a way that um, the dining is evolving. We have a greater range and intensity of flavors. And the one reason why a lot of Koreans get very tired of eating European food uh, when they're up on trips abroad for more than, let's say, one or two weeks, is because we're so spoiled and used to having a bowl of rice with about 10 different dishes that we're so used to the diversity of going in and out. So I call it the roving chopsticks. So chopsticks with rice and about 10 different dishes in front of us, and every bite is a different bite. It's never the same. So this is also a challenge when it comes to wine pairing. Um, and the two things I emphasize is that the wine with Korean food, with this kind of strong, intense flavors, must have versatility. It means if it's too strong, it's going to overpower a lot of the dishes. <laughs> and if it doesn't have a refreshing, good acid backbone character behind the wine, it will not cleanse your palate between bites, because each bite is different. So, my mother told me uh, when we moved to uh, America and I was seven years old, she said to me, um, listen, just because we're in America doesn't mean that you, have to, you can change your values. We have very Korean values. And what one of that means is, I know you're only seven years old, but one day you might fall in love and you might marry someone. And don't think that marriage is this perfect, idealistic American 
dream of two people coming together and forming this great uh, love that will last forever and ever. She said, love is practical. Pairing must be practical. So you're going to fight. You're going to go through hard times. And it's the fact that the majority of the time, you get along well and that you share the same values. Now, I say this because in Korean food and wine pairing, it means that if the wine goes with seven out of the 10 dishes, seven out of 10 times, that means for that table, the wine is a good pairing. So it's a slightly different definition of the wine being perfect with every little dish. So some quickly, some pairing tips. Having similar body and weight is a consideration when you're looking at pairing. I am a big fan of umami we just talked about and mature wines because actually matured wines have been proven uh, scientifically and measured by professors in Japan to have higher umami content. And this is the case with wine like champagne aged on lees, barrel fermented and long aged white wines and red wines that also have long maturation. Um, and the longer that you're able to age it in bottle, the softer the texture of the tannins in red wine become. And what that means is the umami taste of harmony, of suppleness, that, that translates into what works with wine as well. And don't forget that opposites can attract, like oily food with uh, high acid wines, uh, sweet wine like Sauternes, uh, paired with very rich uh, wines traditionally like foie gras. Okay, very quickly to go over a wine list. This is actually a class that I teach at the Hong Kong uh, Polytechnic University um, for uh, a master's degree students doing their wine MBA. But I'm going to go through this very quickly about what you need to do to create a winning uh, wine list that works. You need very clear objectives about what you want to achieve. Why do you want to have a wine list? What's the purpose? Is it really to be the best wine list in Seoul? Is it to just increase wine sales? What percentage of the total revenue do you want it to be about wine? Consider the food. Is it really appropriate? How many is enough? Should it be a 50, uh, uh, 50 bottle wine list? or? 300, or the biggest in, um, in Hong Kong is over 2,000 wines on their list. Um, so you have to know your customers and you have to know the different palettes because as I've traveled around Asia, I've noticed very much that the tolerance for tannins, the tolerance for acidity, the tolerance for spiciness, and you know, for example, that when you put together a very spicy chili, like Kuchjang, kuchkaru, together with red wine, it actually enhances each other. The dish tastes spicier. So if your customers actually are Korean, the majority, and they love that, then it's a great pairing. In fact, the cities I've been to, like Chengdu and Sichuan, or in South Korea, uh, in Busan, where you have your restaurant, and in um, places like South India, Southern India, where they have really spicy food, they tell me, please give me full-bodied red wine because it makes the food taste hotter. I love it. This is what I want. And this is a kind of cultural um, understanding of your market and your customers that you have to be aware of. Um, and of course, the whole logistics of wine means you can't just have a wine list. You have to have properly stored glassware, the space, ongoing staff training. Um, and all of your supplier relationships and contacts, and of course, inventory management. And I'm not going to go through this so much, but I think it's not just about having a great wine list, but it's about how you promote it. And if you're not promoting your wine list, well, you're not getting any value. Um, so these days in this era of, of, of digital connectiveness, as you have here in Korea, it's very important to make sure that you are connected both digitally and personally through events and through tastings to make sure people appreciate the effort and the investment you've put into.
creating a great wine list. So finally, um, just to sum up what I see as the wine revolution in Asia is that wine is actually for winemakers in Bordeaux, in Tuscany, in Napa Valley, in many parts of the world, Australia, Chile, Asia is becoming or is already the most important wine destination market for them. So we as consumers, it's, it's important that we also build a level of confidence to know what we like, to be able to give feedback and say, well, this style of wine really doesn't go with our cuisine. And there are millions of choices in the world of wine, so it doesn't really matter. You're not insulting anyone or any group. I think it's, um, it's time for us to build a little more confidence and, uh, and, and an effort at understanding what this wine revolution is all about. It's also changing our dining culture in a very positive way. Because the one thing I know when I have a wine dinner, without wine and with wine, my dinners are at least twice as long. We, as a culture, as Koreans, we eat too fast. That's a fact. So wine, introducing wine, slows down the meal. And for restaurants, it helps them bring in another source of revenue. It's a, it's a kind of dining evolution culture I think we can learn from and should appreciate um, from, from Europe and, and the Western market. There's a sociological impact and, and, and the relationships that people are building around the table in the era of sending messages and SMSs. Now I think we should have real conversations around a bottle of wine and great food. It also helps us develop our individual taste as consumers of both great cooking, great food, and also fine wine. Thank you. Thank you.